You are listening to episode 131 of the Africana Woman podcast, My Wellness Practice, with Scarlett Zambia's Diamond. My name is Chulu, your host. Let's go. Hello, beautiful. How are you? Woo, this year is just flying by. I am so excited. Today, I'm actually recording from Ndola. And Ndola is my hometown, so I'm very excited to be here. I am speaking at the Sunflower event. And thank you so much to Lady Nomser and her team. They have been so welcoming. We're very excited to be here. The theme is Arise and Thrive. You guys, you know it's going to be lit. Plus, I saw the program, and on the program, they had dancing. <laughs> I don't think they know who they've invited. <laughs> I love dancing. I love it. I'm going to have a great time, so I'm so excited to be here. Now, um, I'm not going to take too long in the introduction today. There is still time to vote for Africana Woman on the Kayana Female MSME Awards. If you haven't done it, guys, get to it. Find the link in the show notes, okay? Today, we are having a conversation with somebody I so admire. She has such a beautiful voice. I remember the first time I heard her sing, and I was blown away. So it is such a privilege to be able to have this conversation. And we are talking so many things, but I think it is such a a, a necessary conversation because this is a mental health month, guys, and we get to have a conversation about that. So please, please enjoy this conversation with Scarlett, Zambia's Diamond. Scarlett is a Zambian musician, entrepreneur, and girl next door. She has been active in the local entertainment space since 2010. She runs a small lifestyle management business alongside this and her day job that focuses on research and data analysis in the FMCG aquaculture space. Scarlett is 35 years old, practicing the way of Jesus, oldest of seven girls, single but strongly attached, She loves people, food, music, books, peace and quiet, writing and learning from the human experience. I am so excited to welcome Scarlett to the Africana Woman Mic. Hi. Hi. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm well. How are you? Good, good. I'm excited. Okay, so let's jump right in. What is your favorite childhood memory? Food. So I actually like tweeted this yesterday. All of my um, all of my memories, like all of my strongest memories, are sensory ones. So it's either sound or a smell or a sensation or the taste of something. And I think that for me, when I think about childhood, my mom used to bake a lot. So really like cake and like vanilla custard and like all of those things. Like for me, I feel like my mom. That was her, to this day, actually, that's that's her way of showing love and her way of, like, giving of herself, you know, the way that she wants to. And I, I think that I've always associated that with comfort. So when you ask me, like, happiest moments in my childhood, there was food involved. Every time there was food involved. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So you grew up in which which town, which city? No, I've lived in Lusaka pretty much my whole life. Mm, listen, yeah. you're the oldest of seven girls. That's a lot I of am. girls. <laughs> How is your household like? My goodness. It doesn't feel like we're that many. Yeah. It's never felt like we were that many. Also, we always joke, like, for me, I always think about it like we were in batches. So we have seniors and juniors and a kasuli. So there's a batch of three that are around about the same age. There's a 30, a 33, and a 35. Mm -hmm. 
and then there was a gap and then there's another batch of three and that batch of three has a 25 a 23 and a 21 and then there's one little one who's like turning 13. so it's never really felt like a lot because we were kind of like in these sections Mm -hmm. um we also didn't have a lot of like extended family around so there was a lot of coming into it as just as a very tight knit nuclear unit we were over and under around and inside and all over each other and like you know you have teenagers then you have it was it was a lot but in my old age um I like to say that a lot I feel like that's the best thing about me like my family like my my sisters are really amazing human beings um everybody's different but also so much of the same um there's a lot of collaborative sort of effort, even like, you know, we help each other, we pull each other up. And that's very important for me, you know, just even just the way I am as a person. And I think it comes from having been in like a family that was big, quote unquote, um, and close, because like we've always been really close. My mom and dad are still together. We were all alive. So that's just, I think, if you say what was the house like, it was very loud, <laughs> very loud. We used to eat a lot. Um, all of us, most of us are overweight. Like it's lovely. It's absolutely lovely. It's a happy, it's a happy, happy little unit, I think. Yeah, I can imagine it's loud because I grew up with uh, just my sister and then we are seven years apart. So like, first of all, there was just like me. So it was like silence. Yeah. And then there's this chatter box yeah. that comes along and I'm like, what is going on? But it was still like relatively quiet, right? Because I, I always wonder, what is it like to live in a big house? Like, ish, anyway. Um... <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't recommend. I don't want to do it. <laughs> No, and so, why? <laughs> one kid and I'm done. <laughs> so tell me, what's the lifestyle management business? Okay, so I own a little thing called Afro Concierge. What Afro Concierge is, is a service delivery. Basically, what you have is a virtual assistant, so like a PA. And I do that. I did that for a few years professionally. And if anybody knows what a good pay, a PA is, a good PA is flexible. So we have a very wide range of things that like we're able to do, it covers anything. But I basically coordinate all the things that you don't want to do yourself type thing. So that's, I think, the easiest way that I can describe what I do. So if it's your errands, stuff that you want to take off your plate because you need to be in the office, if it's coordinating your travel, if it's coordinating travel for people that you're flying in, if it's picking up your kid from school, arranging an event for you, like literally like if you had a PA, what would you ask your PA to do? You hire me to do it. So that's basically what, yeah, that's what my side hustle is. Nice, nice. Lady, so I mean, if you're listening to this, um, you, if you're from Zambia, you probably have heard Scarlett and her beautiful voice. And I know for the listeners that are all over the world, you need to go check her out. But I just wonder, like, how do you manage to do so much? I'm not doing everything at the same time. Yeah. Um, I've had to... I've had to learn, and I think this goes with just life in general, not necessarily always or only about what's on your plate. It goes with life in general. There's always an opportunity cost for whatever it is that you choose to be doing at any given moment. So for me, at this time, there, there are things that I, you know, in a perfect world, I'd love to do everything at the same time, and I'd love to be on stage, at work, on the road, and running stuff for my clients at the same time, but I can't clone myself. So I really had to sort of prioritize um, what needs to be done at any given moment. I've had to prioritize rest. I've had to prioritize like actually stopping and like saying, no, I'm not gonna do anything today. I don't care how lazy this feels, but I actually have to like take a step back and reevaluate what's going on. Um, I have a very demanding job um, and also, you know, personal stuff as well because you have a life outside whatever it is that you do for your bags so I've had to just learn how to prioritize things and um, also learn not to show up for everything so for example if I'm singing somewhere there are reasons for it 
either the client was an old a, a, an old long-standing client of mine um or it's a show that i promoted and put together myself or you know i'm doing a favor for a friend like there's specific reasons why i'll come out and do it um and be able to like set aside that time before i was a very everywhere everything type of person but i've had to learn even just for my own like i'm 35 now i can't really run around as much as i used to i've had to learn how to be like this is how you're going to healthily get through all the stuff that you need to do this quarter and yeah and keep that alive i will be honest and say my music is definitely suffering but um even with that again it goes back to opportunity cost like what did i need to do that was more important at the time than like focusing on pushing that um and once i'm able to get that off 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 the bill like off the ticket then i can be like okay let me keep running with this and plan and do it properly so um yeah i mean it's not possible to do everything all at the same time but like i i i do what i can to keep everything at least to try and keep the pot warm <laughs> type thing yeah i mean yeah. as um if they're aspiring um musicians especially women right um uh-huh. do you believe that um being in the entertainment industry is a viable full-time job right now yeah you just have to do it right um i honestly think that there is a lot of potential in zambia i think there's a lot of potential i don't know if we're going at it the way that we should um and i also think that there are a lot of things that are like barriers to entry for talent because you can be talented at doing one thing and not so great at doing the other for example i am very good at writing music i am very good at arranging music i'm terrible at recording it so i don't record it that much but i'm really good at performing it um i'm not a business minded person at all so managing the business side of being good at being a performer was i think for me one of the biggest problems that i had um and i had a very small team so pulled in people that i knew were on my side and were like able to help me and and all of that stuff so you have to be able to know exactly what it is you're good at you also have to be surrounded by people that you can trust and the other thing about the zambian entertainment industry is you can't stop i've learned the hard way that you can't stop when you stop for whatever reason you're coming back in as a newcomer whether you like it or not because the cycle of of people that are looking out for you it changes and so when you come back in you every single time you stop and start again you have to reintroduce yourself and the resources that go into that are also very difficult just as difficult as the resources that go into keeping it going consistently so i think there are a lot of reasons why it looks like oh it's like really hard and people have to like side hustle and they have to do other things and they have to like maybe in my case get a job you know what i mean um but i do think that it's getting better i, I you can see people are kind of being more creative with what they do it's like i'm not going to be like a one trick pony i sing um i can do tv um i'm going to do like influencing i'm going to like try and see as many opportunities that i can get and keep running with this platform that i have you know lifestyle influencing whatever it is um in order to make sure that one you stay relevant and two you stay paid um and i think that those are important things that people have to look into so like for me if someone came and said like what would you do differently i think that i would probably have not stopped um and i also would not have stuck to just music because i was very adamant about that i didn't like the personal access that being a known individual came with i didn't like that very much it was very anxiety inducing for me so i was like music home i'm not going to do anything else and i i honestly think that i was young enough to make different decisions at the time and i didn't and i think that i should probably have been more flexible and a bit more creative and innovative with what i exposed myself to those are the things that i would do differently so if someone was coming up behind me i'd be like look one figure out exactly what it is you want to do but after making that the main same thing figure out the things that you're good at that can tie into that that's what will keep you going cuz has to be a basket music is cyclical you feel like for example if you're doing gigs there are times in the year when no one's booking so you have to have something else 
what's going on for you at those times. Otherwise, you're going to go hungry. And a lot of people who fall off or just quit, it's because those periods were very difficult. And they were like, I have responsibilities. I have a family. Like, I, I need to go and get my stuff sorted out. And so I think a lot of those things get overlooked when people on the outside are thinking about what it means to be an artist or when upcoming artists or kids are thinking, I want to try and do this. Like you have to, you definitely have to have a fallback plan, but you also have to be able to create something that's sustainable enough to let you still create, but also be able to live without being a burden to people. Because I mean, if you're anything like me, being a burden to people is like the worst thing. Like you don't want that. I would rather not do anything publicly, like nothing entertainment based and like be able to run my life than be entertainment based and like be asking for help all the time, you know? So I think those things are like very important. It's not exactly for me like a negative landscape at all. You just have to be smart about how you enter it and what you're like in it for. So talk us through the fame part, because I think there are people or, you know, being known and just being recognized. Because I think there are people who are, you know, they have some sort of talent, they've got that creativity, but there's that hesitation with your privacy being invaded. You know what I mean? Like, how have you dealt with that? Not very well, to be honest. So I'll give you an example. Like, I think people like Lulu Hangala and Salma and like even Cleo now, you can see her kind of opening up a little bit. Michi, Zambia's sweetheart. Um, I think those people are so brave because, you know, Lulu has her kids in her world, on her platforms, her husband in her world, on her platforms. I could absolutely never do that. Like, I don't have the guts, honestly. I'm also, I don't, she has the thickest skin I've ever experienced in this world. Like, because people say things and people do things and she keeps going. And you can see how, like, in spite of everything that has ever transpired, even the things none of us know about, she's here, you know, she's here and she's doing it. And she's showing all of us, hey, this is me. This is who I am as a human being. She rocks up on her on her real zero makeup, hair looking like, you know, does it give a damn? Her kids are out playing. And like, it's just, it's real. But for me, it's just like, it's so much exposure. You have to be a really, really big, strong person to do that. Absolutely 100%. You have to be very big and you have to be very strong as a person. There is no small, weak, insecure me minded person that can do that and do it successfully it's not possible you have to be there's a certain caliber of human being that you have to be to be able to do that but With that okay. said I, hmm? but when you're saying you have to be big right i don't want people to get confused it's like you're talking big about as in of character like mindset and like your character, yeah right? big as in of character mm-hmm. like you have to be you have to be so when I, when I speak of big, I'm not talking about fame or like you've got millions and millions of followers. That stuff doesn't matter. Um, you have to be like a very substantial human being yourself to know who you are, why you're doing it, what it's for, and how you're protecting those things. Because those things, even if they look exposed to us, she's only showing us what she wants us to see, right? So for me, I feel like you have to be, there's, there's a, certain, like a certain depth of character, bigness, that a person has to have in order to do that comfortably. I could never do that, right? Um, for two reasons. One, I, my, my skin is not thick at all. And two, I'm, I'm known to overshare. And that can have detrimental, um, it, like detrimental consequences for the people that are on the other side of those lights and those cameras. You know, people have families, like it's, if you if you're like me and you you do sometimes don't know where to stop because you're so honest and open or whatever it is you could you could injure your people you know what I mean so I don't think that that's that's one aspect of it the other thing that for me was very anxiety inducing was um, feeling like there was a certain entitlement of people outside of me 
to my information or to my decisions, not even my information, because some of the information I put out there myself, but to my decisions. So people coming back with feedback about why did you do this? Why did you wear that? Why did you go to that gig? You know, things like that. And it was like, mm. and you kind of don't want to snap back and be like, or are you going to pay my bills if I didn't go, you know, that type of thing. So there's a lot of like nuance to it that I, I really did not like. I don't know how other people's experiences have been, but I'm not a clapback queen. So if someone's coming at me about singing the national anthem or whatever that is that y'all niggas thought that you were going to be shady about, I'm not clapping back. I'm watching. I'm feeling bad. I am deleting my socials for two days and then I'm coming back and someone else is running the page. Like I'm not doing that. You know what I mean? So for me, I felt like you have to weigh yourself. You have to measure yourself and know that, okay, this is my capacity. This is how full my cup is. That's not to say I'm not a substantial person. I'm just not substantial enough in those. And so I had to figure out what it meant to protect myself, to protect my people, to protect my image. There's me. I mean, like I have a whole burner account where I just say whatever I want. But as a public person, there was a certain level of decorum that I had to have. And so because of that, there was a lot of I'm going to be the bigger person. I'm going to keep quiet. You know, like I want to have a, an opinion about this topic. But if I say that, I may alienate other people. So I'm going to keep my actual thoughts to myself and just be courteous and graceful and polite, you know, and I've had to do that. I've had to learn how to do that. It's been it's been an ongoing process. I think it's still ongoing um, for a very long time. So. I feel like fame is one thing. I don't think people understand how it can affect. It affects us all differently. For me, I used to get up on stage and I would sing my heart out. And the thing about music is it's an energy exchange. So you're singing and you're, you won't connect to the other person without giving a little bit of yourself away. So if there are 300 people, you're connecting or trying to connect with as many of them as you can which means you're giving every little one of them that you can see or make eye contact with a little bit of yourself, right? I don't care what anybody says. Beyonce is a big deal because she lives through that. You literally feel yourself being drained. And there are not a lot of outlets or places you can go to go and refill that. That was very difficult for me. And so coming out of it, you know, getting off the stage and going home and you went so high and you came all the way down because everyone goes to sleep when you're done. It's like, whoa, you look so good. It was great. See you next year. And they shock. And then you have to go home and like come down from that by yourself. You can actually go nuts. I went nuts. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult, especially if you're trying to be organic and authentic and you're trying to connect with people and you're trying to give them something they can feel. It's it's very difficult. Uh, it's one thing if you're just packaging it and you're out there and you want to be seen and it's nothing that means anything to you. But when it means something to you, you put a lyric out and someone says something that they don't like about the lyric or even someone does a, a cover of it and it's bad. Or someone does the cover of it and it's better than the original and someone just passes a comment and you put your heart and soul into the original lyric, you know, and some comment and it gets to you like you. I mean, I, I got into this thing when I was uh, 22, 23 years old. I didn't know anything. And I didn't manage it well. I'll be honest about that. I didn't manage it well. But everything that I didn't manage well happened in private. Right. So it goes back again to your question of like the fame thing, because every time you're presenting yourself as what is politically correct for the world to see, because the real you, maybe not so much, you know, people won't buy your tickets, but you have to like, you know, there's that like buffer thing. It's, it's, it's hard. Like I, I'm, I respect all of us that do it, honestly, regardless of how it's done and, you know, people's reputations and, that guy's messy, this girl's whatever. Like I respect people that do it because it's a lot to stand on a platform. People don't do it. And it's like where we talk about this guy has a rumor out and everyone's talking about it. And it's like you, people who are talking about it can talk about it because their stuff is not out, right? It's only out because he's a famous person. So it's very, yeah, it takes a lot of strength of character to do it, honestly. Like it's, it's tough. They're good, they're good sides to it. People are kind to you. They send you to give up. But when they turn, bro, they turn. 
and that's tough. Yeah, um, <laughs> I totally relate to when you say, um, you know, like self censoring yourself because yeah. I will, uh, I'm not as uh, consistent anymore, but I write a blog. And I, a friend like called me out. He's like, you know what? I feel like you're not giving everything. And I'm like, I don't think people are ready for everything that's in my head. <laughs> so I'm just like, yeah. Um, and then I also understand when you're saying like, you know, the energy exchange, because I've been in rooms because um, I speak, you know, when speaking and, you know, like literally you're feeling that energy going out. So I can't even imagine like mm -hmm. hundreds, thousands, whatever. Yo, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. A, yeah. And I, I, I mean, have you seen, uh, what's her name? Um, the girl that did this song just now, I'll remember by the time we get to the end of this conversation, but she literally put up a um, post and she's like, she's done. Mm. She just can't. Mm. Um, she did the song with San El Musician, Msaki. Oh, no, I'll go check and that she's, out. Yeah. She's literally just like, she's done. She tried because it, she's done. Sorry. She tried it and she's done because it's taking too much from her. And, you know, people don't think about those things. Mm. It's real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I always used to say? I always used to feel like, let me just do one song. <laughs> just one is enough. <laughs> oh, then they'll come and say, she was a one-hit wonder. Yeah, it's fine. And let me have my life. I have to be walking on the street just fine. The worst thing that can happen to you as a musician is for you to be a one-hit wonder. But the, the second worst thing is for you to be like me and have zero hits. <laughs> No, 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 no. Yeah, I'm just like, I, I don't know. I just, I'm like, just one song. Let me just put it out in the world. And then I'm oh like, I do that. You know, it's one of those things where, like, you know, you, you try something at least once in your life and you're like, okay, just once is fine. Let me do this one time. Why then come and tell me? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, yeah, I'm not great with remembering lyrics. I always get to like halfway and I'm just like, yeah, no. It's that uh yeah I, I i know a couple people who are like that <laughs> yeah so i mean you have mentioned um feeling anxiety um several times already what has been yeah. your journey with um like um your mental health Whew, girl <laughs> do you have time <laughs> <laughs> So um, I know that if like if anyone's watching that's seen me before, follows my pages or anything like that, they know that like I'm a huge um, mental health awareness advocate. Like I'm that guy. Mental health matters all the time. It's the one thing I post consistently about because of how it's affected me and also how I know that it's affecting a lot of people. Um, I'm happy to live in a in a century where we have these conversations and like people are open about the stuff that they go through. Um, oversharing or not. Um, and I think that these are important conversations because they save lives, right? Um, someone might tune in and find you saying just two things, a minute worth of whatever it is that you were saying, and that stops them from making a decision that would mean that tomorrow they were no longer here. So I, I think that it's a very important conversation. For me, it's, it's close to me because I've suffered from depression for years, like probably from when I was like an adolescent. Um, I only got my diagnosis in 2016. So 2016 till now well, is like what, seven years? years? How old then? I was 29. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think for me, the, the most vivid memory of ever feeling that way, because uh, I was diagnosed with um, major depressive disorder. My first episode that I remember, I was about uh, 17. So that's 12 years, pretty much. It may have started earlier than that or not. I, I don't know what triggered it. I don't know what made it start. I don't know really what was what, what all that was about. But um, I lived like that, not knowing what it was and self-medicating with a lot of things that I should never have self-medicated with for years. I got my diagnosis in 2016. And you know, you go in and they tell you, oh, take these pills. This is going to help you cope. And you take the pills and the pills make you sicker. And you tell yourself, I don't want to feel like this. I'm going to try and, you know, work my way out of the system and 
creates like a wellness protocol or wellness practice. I like to call it a wellness practice because it's something that you never stop doing. Um, and my wellness practice is something that I've had to perfect over the last seven, 10 years. Um, a lot of stuff has happened that has thrown me off that journey. But I think the, the most important thing to do is to always come back, like fall off, come back every time, just come back because we all have a right to be here. Um, and so for me, I think having the depression um, on and off, I've had, I think the longest episode that I had was about two years. So I was like consistently just in that, in the doldrums and unable to get out, no medicine, no help, no therapy, no nothing. Started going to therapy in 2019. And I can honestly say that between God, my mom and my therapist, that's what saved my life. Like I, yeah, it was a very, very dark time. When you talk about but, um, doldrums, like what is what did that look like for you? Because I think there's sometimes that people don't even recognize like what's happening. It's just like, okay, and so, maybe it's been I happening it's so long. For everyone. Normal, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's different for everyone. For me, an episode starts with forgetfulness. I start forgetting things. Um, I have to write down simple stuff. We'll have a conversation and two minutes later, I'll walk out the room. I don't know what we talked about. I have to come back and ask you. And I didn't know what that was. I would just, it would, it would happen. And then the next thing I'm like losing time and, you know, losing time for me is the worst part of it because I can be in a place and minutes will pass and I was checked out and then I come back into the place and it's like, what am I doing here type thing? That's very difficult. So for me, the first thing that goes is my memory. And then I start to lose pockets of time. And then you start like sort of the physical symptoms. For me, I get physically sick. So my appetite goes, my body will start feeling funny. I'll get heart palpitations for no reason, like just all kinds of things. And then I'm paranoid. I get very paranoid, like, like any little thing. I could be in my house. I know I locked up. <laughs> I know I locked up, but for some reason, I feel like someone's in the house. <laughs> like, <laughs> so yeah, paranoia. And then, you know, you can't sleep the next thing and everything sort of just leads into itself. Cause then you're exhausted. When you're exhausted, you can't process anything. The less you can process, the more the crying, the less the sleeping, it becomes like a very cyclical thing. You don't come out of it by just waking up one day and saying, oh, I think I'm depressed. Something's going on. For me, every time has been someone pointed it out to me like, hey, are you sure you're OK? And then I was like, um, no. Right. Because it's it's it it hits you and then the truck is just going and you're going with the truck. So someone there's always somebody who will stop you. And then you kind of like are looking and saying, wait, how did I get here? That's for me, that's what happened. So a friend of mine um, had been listening to me talk and complain about stuff for like a few weeks. And then he said, can I take you to see someone? Because I'm thinking this is something, but I, I'm not a doctor, but maybe we should go see someone. So he took me to see that person. And I, I always say like Alinani Mugala, amazing human being, um, really good friend of mine. And he took me and he was like, I don't really know, but it sounds like, you know, so come see this doctor. So I went to see the doctor and the doctor gave me a diagnosis and explained to me what it was. And I was like, and then he started sort of asking me questions that made me see it in hindsight, like, oh, wow, this has happened before. And I think that for me was like the beginning of, of getting to like figure out this is what it is. Um, turns out it, it's, it can happen anyhow. It can be hereditary. It can be triggered by a hormonal imbalance. It can be whatever. But for me, it's definitely chemicals. Um, and it, it often happens when I'm completely exhausted. So I've had to learn how to pay attention. Like when, when, if it's coming, you know, you stop like, and also just staying away from things because prevention is better than cure with this stuff. If you get too carried away, you won't be able to see where you were supposed to stop. So you kind of need to like pay attention to like things that trigger you. So you're not gonna, for me, I'm not gonna overextend myself. Work is Monday to Friday. Friday, cutoff time, we're done. We're not picking up anything after that. We're not taking any calls. We're not answering any questions. It's a boundary for me to protect myself. I don't have to tell anybody. I don't have to like wave a flag or 
I just have to respect the boundary for myself. Um, Saturday's rest day, make sure that my environment is as clean as it needs to be at any given time because clutter also piles up when you're sick. Um, and then also just the people that I have around me. I had friends and people that were around me when I was ill that I don't speak to anymore. Um, I've like had to live a life of like streamlining to make sure that, okay, this is a sterile environment and I can live here, right? I don't get it right all the time. Um, I think if anybody remembers, last year I had a very bad episode um, and that episode lasted about three months. But the cool thing was it was, it was triggered by exhaustion. So it was easy for me to unpack like, once I caught it, I was like, okay. So I went in to see my therapist. We went over the things and she asked me the questions and it was like, okay, you know, you need to sort this out, right? And also you have to take responsibility for your treatment. Um, it's not a, I'm depressed. I suffer from depression, full stop, right? A lot of people don't go past that full stop. I didn't want to stay at the full stop because I lost a lot of things. It damaged relationships for me. It damaged friendships. It damaged my physical health. It damaged my spiritual health. You know, it had me making all kinds of idiotic decisions. Um, and I lost things that I genuinely love. It, it, it's part of what made me lose the music for like five years. Um, and so, I did not want to stay at the full stop. And I think that's the most important part. You can be depressed. There's nothing wrong with you if you are depressed. It's, it's not like you're a substandard human being. But don't stay there. I think that's the most important part is that people need to stay, people need to stay alert to the, how easy it is to just stop there and be like, this is how it is. This is how I am. I suffer from chronic anxiety, full stop. I suffer from, you know, bipolar disorder, full stop. I suffer from ADHD, full stop. I suffer, from, you know what I mean? Like you have to kind of choose to stay alive, like choose to live. That's my biggest thing is like, choose to live, live light, but choose to live. Like wake up every day and say, I'm not staying in this space. I am really blessed to have a support system of people that don't let me stay there you can't manage it by yourself so they don't let me stay there they will sit with me in the moment and say okay this is what it is right now how are we getting out what does it look like when we're out right this is what it needs to be when we're out cool what are we doing to get there let's go right and you you have to be very intentional about having those people around when you're okay so that when you're not okay they know what to do yeah they're like okay man down let's get it moving you know otherwise yeah people die it's not a joke you know it's it's really not a joke people give up they die and they they leave lives behind that could have been full if they got past the full stop so i'm very big on like having these conversations because as much as there's a lot of information out there people don't use it people don't share it people don't understand it and you cannot say to me oh this person, depression is uh, a scourge on the youth because they don't have anything to do. They are unemployed and they feel like they don't have money. That's not what it is. And the more we, we share those very wrong viewpoints, the less people were helping. So for me, it's a really big deal to have the conversation, to be like, I got up and yeah, sometimes it still hits me. There are days that are really bad and I'm like, is this, am I going back there again? You know, um, and like being able to notice the signs, being able to be in a bad space and like literally pick up the phone and be like, hey, can I come in? I don't feel okay, you know, and have someone on the other end be like, okay, your session is booked for 11, you, I'll be here. Like being intentional about healing and being intentional about making sure that you're well, it's like a very big part of getting past the full stop. So I think a lot of us have kind of like watered down and I also think, you know, at the risk of being canceled, mental health is becoming trendy. It is becoming, the conversation is becoming trendy. People are just saying things to say them, you know, and it's, it's dangerous. I think it's very dangerous because you say, some people just say stuff for shock value to make other people get triggered and respond for likes or views or arguments or like for their tweets to blow up. It's very dangerous because this is about like real life issues that people are facing. And in this day and age where people can actually have the conversations, we talk about 
my uncle in the village or my uncle in woodlands was an alcoholic because blah 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 he was probably depressed and didn't know it and had no outlet and he used that as medicine because for them it was man up this is what you need to get done we're blessed to be in an age where we can have these conversations about when you see someone who's looking like this this might be this get them help you know those conversations didn't happen before it was stigmatized it was taboo it was you've got demons all of those things we're not in that world anymore so i feel like that we have a responsibility as people that suffer from it and people that are affected by it because we have loved ones that have died from it or are suffering it from, from it right now we have a responsibility to have these conversations and to share this information and like make it get better it won't get fixed in my lifetime i don't think but it can get better so for me it's important for me to do my little bit to like be like i'm not 100 percent in the clear like i'm not all the way over to the other side and be like oh that's in my past it's never going to happen again i'm not but i'm here and i'm willing to be honest about it and if you want to like connect and for us to like learn as much as we can together and like you know do this then i'm here because so many people don't have anyone for that you know so I think it's a, I mean, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about it. It's a very big deal to me, um, very big deal to me. And I, I want to help, like even just with people who are in my personal circle, I don't leave, I don't let them just sit there like, oh, I've done, no, we have the conversation, we unpack the uncomfortable things, we talk about all your stuff. And when we're on the other side, it's like, no, this is what we need to do to get up because we need to get up. All of us need to help each other up. So that's, for me, that's where it comes from and like where I'm sitting with that. So, yeah, you've spoken about, you know, your support system, um, friends, family, but I'm curious about how you have handled um, your mental, uh, your journey with your mental health in romantic situations. <laughs> Woo, girl. You're going to get me fired. <laughs> uh, so I'll give you two scenarios that are giving you too much information because it involves real, real life people. Um, on the one hand, I've been in situations where um, I was with a person who fully understood what was going on because he's had similar situations himself. Um, and that was also an evolving sort of like an evolving environment because the first time it happens, neither of you know what it is. And you have to be able to be mature on both sides to start having those conversations. Um, kudos to him. He's the kind of person who will stop and say, I don't want to jump into this with you because then we go down together. Um, but what do you need from me? I'm here. I'll be on the other side of the phone. Like, you know, I'll show up. I'll be here. I've also been in situations where you're with a person who doesn't understand what's going on at all and freaks out <laughs> and, you know, freaks out and jumps ship and like, hey, I don't know what this is. I'm going. <laughs> and <laughs> both of those things are terrible, right? So I, I always say that, you know, you go through things so that you can help other people. You don't go through things just to go through things and go nuts. You go through things so that you can be in a position when you're asked a question to be like, you can manage it like this, right? I think be on, being honest with the other person is the first part of it. Like, this is how I'm feeling. It is not normal. This is not how I am all the time. This is what you can expect. You can leave if you need to, but I would really like it if you stayed and leave it there. Let the other person reserve the right to do what is safe for them. You were not born with them. Nobody owes you their presence when you're sick. No one right if you have the right set of circumstances and the right kind of person that person will stick around and he will show up and or she will show up and and help you through your situation and try to understand and educate themselves especially when they they've had no experience with it but you do find people sometimes that will say this is not for me and they walk away i've had to learn that you are not entitled to another person's response i am still learning that i'm not good at that but you're not entitled to another person response so in a romantic situation where your mental health is at play and the other person can't manage it like i don't have the bandwidth to do this because one i don't know what this is and two i don't know how badly it's going to affect me you have to respect that person's right to protect themselves they're not your therapist 
they're not your fixer. You have to do the work to heal yourself. And if you manage and you go back and the person is open to like proceeding, great. If they don't, you have to respect that as well. I think a lot of times we are entitled to other people's and I'm, I'm guilty of this a lot. Like we're in, we feel entitled to other people's responses. If I was you, I would support you and I would be here and I would, you know what I mean? It's not everybody who's you, like who, who do what you would do. Like you're you and they're them. So you have to respect the other person's right at all times to protect themselves. And you also have to stay true to honoring the process of healing within yourself because your healing has nothing to do with the next person. It's about you. The effort has to come from you. The commitment and, if, and consistency has to come from you. It has nothing to do with the next person. So when there is the next person involved, they don't have anything to do with the process. You also have to be wise to situations where you're with a person and you're trying to get through the healing process and they're intentionally triggering you. No, have the sense to remove yourself from that. So I think in romantic situations, it's very nuanced. Like you can be in a very healthy relationship with a very healthy human being and your thing, your um, unhealth, right? Could, or your unhealthiness, is that the correct word? Could destroy that. It's very possible for that to happen. Doesn't say anything about the other person or that what you had was fake. It's just that mental health is a very, very difficult thing to live with, even just for the person that's ill like a, a, mental, a mental illness, it's, it's difficult for the person that's ill. What more for the person that's not and has to be around that every day, right? So you have to really think about it from that perspective whenever you're having a conversation around it or whatever. It's difficult to regulate yourself when you're actually going through it, very difficult. But if you, if you are honest with yourself and you're genuinely getting past the full stop, like I said, then you have to make those decisions from a place of being like, this is something that's about me. It's an internal thing. I need to focus inward and try and whatever this person does is whatever they do. If they stay, I'll really appreciate it. But if they don't, I still have to stay on this path and get to being okay again, right? Um, and I think the danger there is in dishonest communication. I always like to disclose it. Like if I meet a new guy tomorrow, we're chatting, everything's cool, whatever. I'm going to be honest and say, you know, I just need you to know that from time to time, it hasn't happened recently, but, you know, every two, three years or so, something happens. And when I can't manage it, this is what happens. And this is what it looks like. And I need you to know. And ha let that person be armed ahead of time before anything is wrong, that this happens to you. And this is what it looks like. So that they can also make an informed decision about how far in they want to be and whether they want to stay and like learn what that is and help you because they think you're worth it and they think you're, you know, 100%. There are some men who are amazing. They get to the other side of that conversation and they're like, you know what? I'm not going anywhere. We'll do this. You know, I've got you. When you're down, what do you need? I'm going to come clean up, you know? But there are other people who are not like that and you have to hold space for them too. I, I have a very different philosophy on love these days. And uh, again, I might get canceled for this, but your heart needs to be open. Like, let your heart be open. You say, be open to love, but a lot of times like, oh, I'm open to love. And then when love comes in, you close. And when you close, you want it to stay there, right? So when this person starts feeling suffocated and trapped and it's dark, I want to get out. It becomes like a tug of war for them to come and get out of this thing that you closed. I feel like, a better way to love is to say, hi, this is an experience. Come in if you want to be here. For as long as you want to be here, be here. And when you want to be gone, be gone, but leave with love. You know what I mean? So come on in, sit down. Let's have a cup of tea. The tea is done. You want to leave? Okay, you can leave. Because you always have good experiences with someone. It's not every relation. I don't know a lot of people who've been in relationships where they say the whole thing from the first day to the last day, it was bad. That's not real. I don't believe in that. So when the good part is done and the person doesn't want to be there anymore, I have had to learn 
that it has to be like this. Like, okay, hey, you know what? Thank you for being here. Thank you for the experience that I've had. You were an absolute jewel to me and it's done now. Go in peace and leave it. And I think re relationships are always transitional. They change. It's you meet a guy who's just a guy who turns into your friend, who you talk through things with, and then he becomes your boyfriend. Then he becomes your fiance. Then he becomes your husband. Then he becomes your ex-husband. And then he's just dead, right? Or it goes the other way, but everything is transitional. You're always moving from a stage to another stage, to another stage, to another stage. So if you hold on to like, this is where we are, you're not always going to be there. And when, when it changes, then what? You get left behind. You know what I mean? So I just feel like relationships are tricky. It can be your mental health. It can be your weight. It can be your background. It can be your financial status. It can be anything. You have to have um, enough, again, substance in, within yourself to say, this is what this person feels they need to do to protect themselves and to respect the environment that they've created within which they feel safe. And I can't insert my own beliefs or my own way of doing things into what they feel. I have to accept that that's where he is. And if that's where he is and I can't meet him there, then I'll just let it go. Like that's, it's fine. I'm going to focus on my healing and getting past this moment because this moment is not great. You know, and if he's leaving me here, he's leaving me here. I'll cry about it. That's okay. But I'll get to the other side. Do you know what I mean? Rather than adding that to the bag and saying, this person did this to me because I was sick. No. You, they just did that. Let it go. You know, I've had to, it's not an easy thing, but I've had to learn that it's an easier way to live afterwards. Like it hurts in the moment, but if you're, if you've already released them, then it's not, it doesn't, it passes. Yeah. yeah. So as we're winding down, I'm curious about where do you, like right now, where do you see yourself or where do you see your music going or maybe it's not in the future? Like, you know what I mean? Like what, what is, what's next for you? Um, Saturday. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm being an idiot. Um, I'm very like day at a time. Yeah. Um, because I, I'm very day at a time, but I'm I've also become very intentional. Like the last two three years, I've had to be really intentional about a lot of things. Uh, I keep telling my siblings, I don't have the luxury of time. I don't believe that any of us do have the luxury of time reason why I say this is because you're born, you live and you die. No one tells you when these things happen. You're not given advance notice. You're going to be born on Monday. You know what I mean? The same way you're not given advance notice. You're going to die on Friday. Like, so none of us have the luxury of time because we know for sure that we don't know how much time we have today might be my last day here. Anything can happen. Right. Um, and so because of that, and I, I, I say this because it's death that has taught me that mm. um, people actually dying who, in my very, very humble opinion, should not have died. So we don't have the luxury of time because we do not have the luxury of time. We have to be very intentional about what we're doing with the time that we have. Number one for me is I've told myself for the past four years, I was trying to create an experience of myself for others, where I used to say all the time that I want everyone to have a beautiful experience of me. Even if it's just one, we meet once, we speak once and you leave, you should always leave feeling like I met somebody special today. That was very important to me. I don't know that I've done that as well as I could have. Um, I, I know for sure that there are people who will be like, no, she, that was not a beautiful experience at all, <laughs> but I'm human. Um, but at the same time, I think I've changed a little bit from that and told myself that as much as there was a lot of outward expression of wanting that, I've turned inward now because I want to create a beautiful experience of life for myself, whatever that means. So that's number one on my list of things to do is literally to be like, with the time that I have left, I want to live a beautiful life. And this doesn't necessarily mean, you know, having expensive things or whatever, but it means living slowly, which is something I'm trying to learn. 
from people that are close to me, living slowly, like savoring the moments that you have with people and things that you do and the stuff that you enjoy. So living slowly, living meaningfully and also giving away. Because I don't want, I want to die empty. I don't want like when I get up to heaven, God is asking me, and these things which I told you to give, why do you still have them? You know what I mean? So that speaks to music. I don't believe I was given my gift to keep it to myself and to sing in my bathroom. I, I don't believe that. I believe I mismanaged it. And um, as a result of that, certain consequences followed. And I'm 100% owning and taking responsibility for those things. But I think that when it comes to the third thing that I'm saying that I must give everything away, I'm going to do that. So there's going to be music. There's going to be performances. There's going to be church tours. There's going to be like connecting. There's going to be teaching. There's going to be like all of it. Like I really feel like there's a lot in me, even just as an artist, that is not for me. It's for it's for you. You know what I mean? And I don't want to sit here with it. I just have to make sure that I'm doing it in a way where it is meaningful. Going back to my second point, it is meaningful and it is giving value to other people. And it's connecting with you in a way that makes you feel like, again, you experience something beautiful and you've walked away from that feeling like more of a person or comforted or inspired or built up in some kind of way, or it's pointed you to a better practice of your own faith, whatever it is. I feel like that's a very important part of like what my, my life motto is. Yeah, there's things, you know, there's things that we make important. Like, I really want to get married and have a kid and have a really nice family and a home. And I, every time I do like a 40-day fast, I'm like, God, please give me a family of my own. But <laughs> that's not the main thing for me. The main thing for me is to live a beautiful life, to live a meaningful life, and to give. Those three things for me are like the most important things. So whether it's giving of what I have or it's giving from my gift or it's giving time, like, I want to be someone who will be remembered for being the person you could go to, like a lighthouse. That's like a very big deal for me. Um, and I think it's, it's made, when I say I don't have the luxury of time, it's made it easier for me to decide what to do with my time. You know, so I'll give you one hour, 30 minutes, two hours of my day to do your podcast, because I know that it's worth it to you. And it's worth it to me to be able to have a conversation which is not foolish and is going to help somebody or is going to like enlighten someone on something and be honest and be authentic and show up and give you something. And you get to walk away with that and say, there was two things that she said that I really, really liked. The rest of it was rubbish, but like there were two things that she said, you know, and, and be able to do that every single time I interact with someone. I think those things are like the most important things to me because then when I get to it, if my day ends tomorrow, I can count you. You know what I mean? So that's my, for me, that's like where I'm at, like in life in terms of what's next. It's changed very much from being like, I want to give people a beautiful experience of me because that gives a lot of it away. I, I want to create a beautiful life for myself. I want to create a meaningful life for myself and I want to give. Those are the things that are next, like till I die. That's it. Summarizes it very simple. I love it. I love it, love it. So Me too, in eh? the Africana woman community, we have a saying, which is know your roots, grow your purpose. So I've got four mm -hmm. questions for you. Just tell me whatever comes to mind. Cool. Um, you ready? Yeah. Okay. So the first question, what are you rooted to? God and my family. Okay, cool. Then what are your favorite ways to nourish your mind, your body, and your soul? Okay, dramas. <laughs> Don't start with K dramas, please, because people know me and K dramas. Like, no, 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 no. K dramas. Like, okay, which one now? Which is the last one you watched? Uh, I'm watching Trolley. Do you know? Okay, do you I just started watching. Mm -mm. I've taken a break because the problem with me is that when I start, I have to finish. And then I'm like, this is the thing in my life. Like, I can't. Why did you watch that? <sighs> hmm? The last Why one did I watched. Watch I'm trying to remember which one. I did like a whole. Oh, no, 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 no. I remember it's the doctors. Um, They're banned. I don't know if you, you've watched that one. Um, It's five oh. friends, um, four guys, and one girl. 
uh, well, like then they're not uh-huh. like young. They're like in their forties almost. Um, and they work at this. They all work in the same hospital. Um, they all have different specialities, but they they band. So like to you know nurture their friendship, they play um, every now and then. They play a band oh. together. You should watch it. It's so good. Yeah, no, it's really, really good. But, and it's two so I'm seasons. Watching what? It's two seasons. It has four seasons. Two. Only two. Like, but they're short. No. No, I, I don't know. Like, no, I, I, there was two. There was, short is relative. Uh, there was one episode which was like two hours. And I was like, are these people for real? Like, this is my life. <laughs> Two hours of your life, you're never going to get back. <laughs> but I have to watch. I will still watch. Yeah, I'm watching Trolley. I just finished watching The Glory. Um, after Trolley, I wanted to watch this thing that's called Fabulous, but I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. It looks a bit boring. But yeah, I'm watching Trolley. I'm trying to finish it. Um, I am a huge so yeah. Nourish my my mind, spirit, my body, and my so my body. I'm very terrible with that because I love food and all of it unhealthy. Um, I'm currently trying to lose some weight and like get my stuff together again. So I've, I've, I'm trying to make lifestyle changes in terms of what I eat, but with my body to, to heal my body and nourish my body, I sleep a lot. Mm. I sleep a lot as a coping mechanism too, but I sleep a lot. I like to sleep because I feel like when I sleep, I switch off the world. And even if when I come back, everything is still there exactly as I left it, I slept and I sort of regulated in my sleep and I come back at zero and then it's like, okay. Let's look at this again. So I sleep a lot. Um, I spend a lot of time by myself. A lot of time by myself. So when I'm by myself, K-dramas, I read. um, I do a lot of podcasts, especially faith-based podcasts. um, And music. Like I listen to a lot of music, a lot of very different music. This whole week I've been on a very interesting gospel tip and I found some really beautiful songs. So... I listen to a lot of music. I read a lot of things. Um, I try to fill my mind with lightness because I, like I said, Monday to Friday is like work and work is very like intense. And like, I'm trying to make sure I'm not dropping anything. And, you know, I move around a lot because I do a lot of M and E and the other part of it is data analysis. Like it's a lot of stuff that I do. So I try to like, when I'm not doing those things, I'm not trying to sit here and be like, I'm going to study Confucius. I'm not doing that. Um, but I read a lot. I watch a lot of documentaries um, about history, about sport, about crime. Um, I like to do that, like to sort of fill my mind up with stuff that I don't know. Because like I said, I've always lived in Zambia. I'm not the most exposed person. So to mitigate that, I read a lot. I watch a lot of things. I try to learn stuff about languages, about traditions in different cultures, um, origins of different music, that kind of stuff. I love to do that. And then I also spend a lot of time with my mom. My mom is uh, my mom is probably the best thing about me. So I spend a lot of time with my mom. And then, you know, sometimes I'll have a paramour and his grace and I'm out there and, you know, we have a good time. For the most part, I spend a lot of time with me now because I want to make sure that, like I said, I'm living the way I want to live. And so I think n- nourishment is about feeding. I feed myself in quiet. And, uh, you know, on any given Sunday, I'm going to go to Lukanda because spa days are life. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Um, do you have a weakness that has now become a superpower? Ah. Uh, I think it's a work in progress, but I would say my honesty. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a work in progress. I have to learn, like I said, I'm a bit of an oversharer. So I have to learn where the boundary is between being honest and open and vulnerable in the pursuit of having a meaningful conversation with someone or presenting a, a meaningful idea or concept or writing a meaningful song. Um, so the line between being unnecessary and doing that right is something that I'm still trying to learn. Um, had a very deep conversation about it this morning, actually. And so I'm, I'm, I think for me, my honesty has been a weakness because I've been like, I just say whatever comes to mind, don't care what the effect of it is or whatever. 
but I've had to learn, you know, you grow and you mature. And it's like, why are you saying what you're saying? It's my emotion. How I hold space for other people see is turning into something that is becoming like a weapon and a superpower. And so the adore about myself, but we're working on it. I've given myself to 40 <laughs> to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the final question is, what do you know as a certainty? That I know nothing. <laughs> Three things that I know is certainty. I don't know very much. Um, the future is not promised at all, but I have control over what I do with today. And God really, really loves me. Those are good. Okay, Scarlett, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you. Um, so where can people find out more about you? How can they support you? What are you up to? Is there anything that we should be looking out for? Scarlett, Zambia's diamond, wherever you'll find it. And yeah, let's. I, I really like to interact when I can. So that's something that I also have to work on being more consistent with. But yeah, my platforms are open. People reach out all the time. I'm a very, I try to be an open book without being too much. So yeah, I'm out here. And um, what I want is to like organically, like organically share my life with others without making it feel packaged or rehearsed or any of those things but at the same time do it in such a way that they're getting something from it. Like, it's not like, Oh, we saw how she was twerking. Like no shade to people who twerk. I can't twerk. That's not going to be my contribution to the universe because I can't twerk, but also because I feel like there are other things that I can do better. And I, I, I want to focus on that. All right. Thank you so, so much for your time. I am grateful. Thank you for having me. <laughs> but yes, me too. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I think from our conversation, one of the main takeaways is that support system. You know, if you are going through some mental health issues, it is so important to have a strong support system, people that can identify when something is wrong, people that want to be there for you to support you in those moments of crisis and not keeping it to yourself, right? I think that is one of the things that I took away from this conversation that she has really surrounded herself with people who absolutely want to help and can identify when something is a bit off, you know? So as we go through this month on um, mental health awareness, guys, please, 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 let's look out for each other. It is so important. Now, you know what time it is? It's time to give our guest her roses. Please find Scarlett on Instagram or Facebook at Scarlett Zambia's Diamond. Tell her you heard her on the Africana Woman podcast and say thank you. Take a screenshot, share it to your stories, tag us, let us know what you learned, okay? The best way to support Africana Woman podcast is to share it. Share it with everybody, your sister, your friends, mother, everybody, please, okay? And then, guys, like I said, please vote for Africana Woman for the Kayana Female MSME Award. We have been nominated in the category of Best Diaspora Excellence Award, okay? The link is in the show notes. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the Africana Woman podcast. I absolutely love that you're here and we are a growing community. The Africana Woman podcast is part of the Africana Woman Network. My name is Chulu, your host. Until next time.